Revelation chapter 12. Would you find that? Revelation chapter 12. We're going to talk tonight about the war of two worlds. Depending on your definition of war in human history, there have been somewhere between 3,200 and 10,400 wars on the planet. Depends on how you define it, uh, what you'll qualify as a war. Uh, most of those wars have been fought between two nations. And if not two nations, two groups within a nation. What got real interesting was in the 19, early 1940s when World War II uh, began. And before the war was over, there were only 12 nations on the planet that were not somehow contributing to the war on either the Allies or Axis side. It truly was a world war. So since, well, you can go all the way back to the book of Genesis if you want to. All the way back into human history, you're going to find wars. Uh, we're used to hearing about wars on planet Earth. We don't like it. Uh, we saw Russia's invasion into Ukraine coming. We don't like it, but it doesn't shock us, does it? It doesn't surprise us when we hear about a war. Burhanu has been keeping us informed of the ongoing conflict in the northeast part of, uh, of Ethiopia. And we've heard about that war there. We know what's going on in South Sudan. We know the, ch the, the, the Chinese threat that continues to go. But it doesn't surprise us when we hear about war because, quite frankly, that's human history. We hear about war, war, and war. Revelation chapter 12 is, is a chapter that is wrapped up in conflict. We talked about this morning uh, the war between the pregnant woman and that dragon. And we are making our way down to this. In our text tonight, verses 7 through 17, we're going to continue that image of conflict and war. But there are shocking words there in verse number 7, and I hinted at that this morning with you. The way verse number 7 starts, I, I just have a hard time picturing it. Maybe you don't, uh, but I do. Look what it says in verse number 7. There was war in heaven. What in the world? War in heaven. I never, saw, I never saw heaven as a battleground. We think about it on earth, absolutely. But war in heaven catches us off guard. Uh, but this war is going to settle a conflict that has been raging since before the world was formed. Earth came into existence and our solar system came into existence after this war started. This war is between God and, and the devil. It's been going on for such a, a long time. We talked about the details of that war. Satan got lifted up in pride. Remember that from this morning? You probably knew it before this morning. He got lifted up in pride. God, uh, God uh, quashed that pride and has kept Satan in check, uh, has kept him on a short lease. Satan doesn't get to do whatever he wants, but he and one-third of the angels are in rebellion against him, uh, that's when Lucifer became Satan. We talked about all of that this morning. And all he's been doing for the last, I don't know how long, but, um, he's just been trying to disrupt God's plan on every level. During these thousands of years that at least we've been in existence, we've not been in existence, by the way, for 65 million years. Mankind, human, the human race is not 65 million years old. There is physically... If a scientist is if if a scientist is honest, there is physically no way that the Earth could have been in its rotation process for 65 million years and anything form on it. Can I just give you a little? Uh, uh, can I just mention something here? It's just it's just fact. Scientists know that they know what the rotation of the Earth is they know that it is minusculely slowing down. There's no way you can back this process up 65 million years and anything stay on this planet. It would be revolving so fast. Well, you've been at a playground before with your kids or as a kid. You get on the merry-go-round. What do you want to do? Dad, come over here and spin us. 
and dad gets it going. He winds that thing up, and that thing's flying. It is all you can do to hold on for dear life, or it's going to sling you off over toward the slides or swing set, isn't it? That's exactly what it would have been life on planet Earth 65 million years ago. There's no way anything could have stayed on the planet. It would have been revolving so fast that nothing could have formed. So this battle hasn't been going on for 65 million years, at least your battle and my battle. At best, we're 10,000 years old. At best. Now, nothing to do with Revelation chapter 12, but I just get tired of evolution being crammed down my throat as if it were proved fact. So don't buy into it. Get you some good books from Answers in Genesis. Buy Ken Ham's book on the young earth and just see how it is. So I don't know how long the conflict. Now I'll give it to you. I'll give this to you. The war between Satan and God, it could have been going on for a lot longer than you and I have been in existence as a human race. I'll give that to you. But this battle that's been going on, this great red dragon that is fighting against, he's fighting against God, it has an end. It's going to come to an end. We're going to talk about the end of this battle that's been going on for at least 10,000 10, years. This battle between Satan and God. We know that during this, this, on, this conflict, this ongoing conflict, we know that Satan has limited access, doesn't he, to heaven. When Satan and the third of the angels were kicked out of heaven, that wasn't a permanent expulsion. We know from Job chapter 1 and Job chapter 2 that Satan has access back and forth between heaven and earth. Where hast thou been, Satan? I've been walking up and down through, uh, through the earth. What have you been doing? Well, just looking around. Seeking whom I may devour. He's got limited access to heaven right now. But there's coming a day when he is finally and eternally expelled from heaven. That's what the end of Revelation chapter 12 deals with. So we're going to talk about that tonight. And I know that some of these details, here's my introductory thought for you. While some of these details here are confusing, these verses, the end of chapter 12, are actually a blessing to the children of God in that they tell us of a day when Satan will finally and eternally be thrown out of heaven. So let's look at these verses and let them be an encouragement to you tonight as a Christian. You're not always going to battle Satan. Thank the Lord. I get tired of him. There are times, aren't there, where you're tired of Satan? And then there are times when you're ticked off at him. I just get mad at Satan when I see the havoc that he can wreak in people that I love or churches that I respect. And you just get mad at him. There's coming a day when I don't have to worry about him anymore, thankfully. Let's read these uh, 11 or so verses, starting at verse number 7. There was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. The great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him, by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants, the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil has come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. And when the dragon saw that he was cast out unto the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child, and to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the face of the serpent. And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. And the earth helped the woman. And the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth. 
And the dragon was wroth with the woman, and he went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which kept the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. There's coming a time, and I, I believe this is pointing to halfway point of the tribulation period, where Satan will no longer have access. Halfway through the tribulation period, he will no longer have access to heaven. He's kicked out. I say that because in that verse, in that text, it says that at this point when he's finally cast out of heaven, he knows that he has but a short time. So there's coming this time when Satan no more goes into heaven, no more uh, stands before God accusing the brethren. So some things are going to change in the tribulation period. Let's look at this text tonight. And again, here's what I want you to, here's what I want you to leave here tonight with. I want you to leave here encouraged as a Christian that Satan is already a defeated foe. He knows it. He, he knows it. Satan, I'm, I'm afraid of this. I'm afraid Satan knows the word of God better than I do. I think there are things in the scripture Satan has, has an understanding of that I don't. He's been around longer. He knows what's coming. He knows all of the implications of Christ's death on the cross and his subsequent resurrection. He knows he is a condemned angelic creature. But at this point in history, which has not yet occurred, he's figured out, I don't have much time left. He doesn't know, just like you and I. He doesn't know the day Jesus is coming back. But he knows when the great tribulation is going to start. He has an active role in it. And the Bible says at that point, he knows his time is short. What is he going to do then? I mean, the heart that you and I have, the Bible says, is desperately wicked. What is an angelic creature who has such supernatural power as he does, what is he going to do like, what, what is he going to be like, and how is he going to behave when he is desperate? I, I don't think we've seen a desperate devil yet, but it's coming. Let's look at this tonight. Let's talk about what's going on here. First thing is this. Let's talk first of all about the revealing of this dragon. We talked about him some this morning, but there's some more details given here tonight. So let's talk about the revealing of him. I pointed you this morning, and I'll do it again if I may. I'll point you again to several passages that talk about his origin. As a Christian, I would encourage you to know Satan's background. Know him as Lucifer. Find out who he is. You want those passages again? Ezekiel uh, chapter 28, verses 12 through 19. Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 through 20. I've already referred to 1 Peter 5, 8, the work of the devil. He walks about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. This is his goal. So let's talk about this, the revealing of the dragon. What can we learn about him? Well, in verse number 9, first of all, we're given several of his names. His names. It talks about in verse number 9, he's the great dragon, the old serpent, the devil, and Satan. The dragon we talked about this morning, I think the picture is that of, it may be different. I may just have too much reliance on sci-fi here, but what I know about a dragon, what you know about a dragon, a winged creature with a snake's body and has four legs. Uh, that's just how I picture. The Bible is trying to draw for us a vicious, destructive creature. And when I say dragon, you don't think pet. That's what you think of, destruction and danger. It's, he's called a dragon. I think that's a, a fitting image for Satan. He's bent on destruction. He loves death. It's also, he's also called the old serpent. Well, that runs us right back to Genesis chapter 3, doesn't it? Uh, the first encounter with Adam and Eve. He's presented as a serpent there. Uh, he deceives Eve. He entices her to take the fruit. And the, the New Testament says she does so having been deceived. He is an evil, deceitful, sly creature. He's a serpent. I have those feelings for every snake I see. I think they are conniving to somehow get me. Those crazy people down there in Florida that are trying to catch those pythons you know, that have been released, and they walk up to those 10 and 12, 14-foot snakes, and you'll see them. They'll put videos on, on YouTube. And I'm, 
Half time I'm cheering for the snake. I'm like, bite him. That guy's a moron trying to grab you barehanded. And they do. That snake, when I look at him, I look at that snake's face. All I think is, that's the animal, the serpent that God chose to depict Satan as. And he, he's deceptive. And I'm telling you this, church. Your enemy is deceptive. He will make you think things are not as bad. I, I, I love that uh, Randy Ray sermon he preached. The first time I heard him preach it, I was a kid. Um, over in Knoxville, Tennessee at Southside Baptist Church. He, Randy Ray and A.V. Henderson were preaching a revival over there. And he came in. At that time, he was, he was pastoring the Metropolitan Baptist Church in Nashville, Tennessee. Brother Ray was. And he comes in. And he preached a sermon called The Three Characteristics of Sin. And that sermon has been preached by other people. And the cathedrals wrote a song about that sermon. But it originated with Randy Ray. And if you ever have the opportunity to hear that message, you should. Because he bases his three points on life experiences with, that he had with people that he knew. And the three characteristics of sin that he preached uh, when I was a sophomore in high school sitting over there in South Knoxville, Tennessee was that sin will take you further than you want to go. It will keep you longer than you want to stay, and it will cost you more than you want to pay. Do you know why those three characteristics of sin are true? It's because of the deceptiveness of your adversary. Sin is not your enemy. Satan is your enemy. Sin is the result of his work on you. And all of those things about sin are true because you have a deceptive, sly, conniving enemy. He's the old serpent, Scripture says. And then it says he's the devil. The Greek word is, sounds very much like the Hispanic word, diabolos. That enemy, or, or that word means slanderer or accuser. When the Bible describes our enemy as the devil, it's calling him a slanderer. An accuser. In fact, that's what it says. Is it verse? Is it verse ten? Uh, no. Ver, yeah, the end of verse ten. There, for our, the accuser of our brethren is cast down. That's what the word devil means. It pictures this one who is standing before God and he's accusing. He's accusing God's people. He did it in Job chapter one and verse number two. Uh, we see that plain, plain as day, and. He's still doing it toward you and me today. He's the accuser of the brethren. And then the last title for him there, the last name for him there is Satan. That word literally means adversary. One who stands opposed. One who stands opposed. He is our adversary. That's what he is about. Anything that is God-related, Satan is against it. Don't ever think, church... Christian, young person, old person, don't ever think Satan is for you in anything, anything. If he's holding it and it looks good, it is the poison apple that Sleeping Beauty was offered. It doesn't matter how good it looks. It's a poisoned apple. It's a baited hook. He is never for anything that God is for. He is your adversary. He is Satan. He's against the person of God. He's against the work of God. He's against the church of God. He's against the people of God. He stands opposed to everything about God. So God calls him no longer Lucifer. God says your name is Satan. You are the one who opposes. You are the adversary of everything. Those are his names. He's the dragon, the great dragon. He's the old serpent. He's the devil. He is Satan. That's his names. We also learn in these same verses, in verses 9 and 10, we learn about his nature. Not just his names, but we learn about his nature. It says in those, verse, uh, those verses that he's cast out, he's, he's those names, He's Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of the brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. 
We learn in verse number 9, first of all, about his earthly deceptions. His earthly deceptions. The Bible says in verse number 9, he deceiveth the whole earth. That is his mission. He's lying to you. I don't want to repeat everything I just said, but in Job chapter 1 and in Job chapter 2, God says to the devil, where have you been? Here's his reply, going to and fro in the earth and walking up and down in it. Do you know what that sounds like to me? That sounds like a lion on the prowl. Going to and fro throughout the whole earth and walking up and down in it. He's always looking for that. Satan is always plotting someone's downfall. He's always doing this. This is what he does. He works in this earth to figure out ways that he can destroy someone's soul. He's walking to and fro throughout the planet. He's trying to figure out how to turn people away from Christ. And if you're already a believer, he's trying to figure out how to tear up your home and destroy your testimony and make you as ineffective for Christ as a chair. He is against you. He is, he is walking up and down in this earth and he's looking to deceive. In fact... He can be at work among us and we don't even recognize him because 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen 14 says that he appears as an angel of light. Satan can show up and go to work in a church and will think he's a good guy. How does he do that, Pastor? Because of his earthly deceptions. We're told all the way back in Genesis 3, the first time we meet him, what's one of the adjectives that describe him? Subtle. He's more subtle than any creature in the field. I'm telling you, those snakes, you better watch out for them. That's him, deceptive. He's a deceiver. He will continue to weave his web of lies until he is ultimately cast into the lake of fire. He's a liar and the father of it. His earthly deceptions. Not only that, but verse number 10 tells us about his heavenly declarations. He's not only working at earth to deceive people, He's up in heaven and he's making declarations. What are his declarations? Accusations against God's people. Verse number 10 says he's the accuser of our brethren. We already said he did that. Job chapter 1 and verse 6. Job chapter 2 and verse 1. We know that he did that with Job. Did you know he also did that with a high priest by the name of Joshua in the Old Testament? Zechariah chapter 3. Same thing. He does it today. He's accusing the brethren. He doesn't, oh, I wrote this down. He doesn't always have to lie in those accusations about us, does he? Sometimes he's ta he takes my sinful thought or my sinful word or my sinful deed and he marches right into the courtroom and exhibit A is me. He is a plaintiff filing grievances and charges against the defendant. I'm the defendant. And a lot of times we give him enough ammo to where his evidence, his evidential case is pretty strong. Now sometimes he'll lie about us because that's what he does. But oftentimes, let's be honest tonight, he doesn't have to lie. He doesn't have to make things up. So he walks into the courtroom and he starts making these accusations. These are his heavenly declarations. What are they? Well, of course Job, God, doesn't turn his back on you. Look what you've done for him. He's got more money than you do. Look at his health. Look at the abundance of his family. He's got ten kids. They're all in perfect health. He's got more goats and camels and donkey, donkeys and oxen than anybody. You take those things away from him, God, he'll curse you. He's the accuser of the brethren. Do you not think he does that to you today? Your name comes up. My name comes up. He looks for people. He's walking about to and fro in the earth. Thank God when he goes into that courtroom with all the evidence that I give him, thank God there's a defense attorney on my behalf. Listen to these verses, 1 John chapter 2 and verse number 1. My little children, these things write I unto you, that you sin not. That's good advice, isn't it? Church, stop sinning. Just don't do it. I'm writing these things to you that you sin not. But John knows, doesn't he? 
And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. I don't stand up against those charges that Satan lays out against me. Jesus stands up. He's my advocate. He's my defense attorney. Romans chapter 8, verse 34. Who is he that condemneth? Who's the guy slinging the accusations over there at the prosecution's table? I love Paul's attitude. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Satan, really? You're going to take Jesus Christ on in court? He's the one who paid for all the sin that you're crying about. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25. Wherefore he, Jesus, is able also to save them to the uttermost that, make, uh, that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. That advocate is the one, uh, the advocate is the one who pleads the case of another before a judge. And that's exactly what 1 John 2, 1 is talking about. Jesus Christ, our advocate, stands up when the enemy stands to accuse the brethren. He pleads our case based on his own death on the cross, which was the perfect payment for our sins. So no matter what Satan accuses me of over here, the defense attorney over here says, paid for, paid for, paid for. And eventually, God says, case dismissed, that's it. So he goes back out, and what does he do? When Satan leaves that courtroom, what does he do? He goes back down to earth, and he walks about, and he looks for people that he can falsely accuse. He's, he's got these earthly deceptions that he's working up but he's also got these heavenly declarations. That's the revealing of the dragon. We know about him. We learn about him through his names and through his nature. He's our enemy. I'm telling you that because Paul said that you and I are not to be ignorant of his, advice, of his devices. So let's know our enemy. Not just the revealing of this dragon, but I like the next one, the removal of him. The removal of the dragon. It says uh, here that he, at the end of or at the end of verse number 7, it says the dragon fought his angels. They're fighting against Michael and his angels. I believe that Michael's position is the general of all forces in the angelic army. That's my opinion. I can't know that for sure. Maybe he pulls double duty and does something else. But here, he is the one leading the angels. They are called, not God's angels, they're called Michael's angels. Patton's soldiers. Michael's angels. Satan and his angels are fighting against Michael and his, his angels. And about Satan, it says in verse number 8, And they prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. We are done here. That's what he said. We are done here. So there, And then in verse number 10 and verse number 11, not only is he defeated by one, but he's defeated by two different groups. First of all, Satan is defeated. This dragon is defeated by a heavenly warrior. That's Michael and his angels. I believe Satan initiated this war in heaven. He's the one that got lifted up in pride and he rebelled against God. Satan initiates this war, but God ends this war. He wins it. And he does, he does so in part through these heavenly, uh, these heavenly angels, still faithful to God, following Michael the archangel, Jude Chapter 1, there's only one. Jude chapter 1 and verse number 9. His name, by the way, Michael, his name means who is like God. Don't you love that? Uh, that, that, that goes with so many verses that we'll not turn to in, in Isaiah where, where God says to the prophet, there is none like me. And that's what Michael's name says, who is like God. Daniel chapter 10 and verse number 13, talking about this angel, Michael calls him one of the chief princes. And two chapters later in chapter 12 and verse number 1, Michael is called the great prince. He stands in opposition to the devil and his armies. He is strengthened and empowered by God. And, and the Bible says that Satan and his armies cannot prevail against Michael. So in verses 8 and 9, he is cast out. Here's another little tidbit. You know that, do you see that verb cast out? It's in verse number uh, nine, the very first opening phrase. The, dra the great dragon was cast out. 
that word cast out, it draws the picture of something being thrown without caring where it lands. It's just... It's just, you just grab that thing and just chuck it. It is gone. You just want it out of here. You ever, have you ever picked up a, I, I get a, and it's warped, I realize this, I get a warped sense of satisfaction seeing other people scared. I love videos where it shows people getting scared. There are, uh, th there's, a, there's a thing going around where these guys, they tie a, like somebody will be sitting or standing somewhere and they quickly attach a long snake, a fake snake, but long, to that dude's foot. And then they'll say something, and that guy starts running, and there's about this much cord that they can't see between their foot and that snake. And when they start running, here comes that snake three feet behind them. And no matter how fast they run, that snake's keeping up. And that just cracks me up, and I'm like, that is hilarious. If that happened to me and my fear of snakes, I would die. I'd just go straight to heaven. I wouldn't run very far at all. It just cracks me up. But that guy wants to get away from that snake. He wants it gone. Have you ever picked, I, I've done this before, you ever picked up like a rag or something in your garage? You pick that up and you see a spider in there and immediately, it could be a granddaddy long legs, it doesn't matter, immediately your brain says, because we live in East Tennessee, your brain says brown recluse. And I'm thinking, brown recluse. And I pick that thing up, first sign of a spider, I am tossing that towel. I don't care where that thing lands. I just don't want it near me. I'm casting it out. And I don't care where it goes. I just don't want it here anymore. Satan is cast out of heaven because he's not allowed to be there anymore. He's cast out. And it's final when this happens. He is defeated, the Bible says in verses 7, 8, and 9, by a heavenly warrior. And in verses 10 and 11, he's also defeated by holy witnesses. Look at verse number 10 again. I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is salvation come, and strength in the kingdom of our God, and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and the, by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. Well, there's a loud voice coming from heaven. Now, immediately when you start reading verse number 10, you think to yourself, loud voice coming from heaven, this is God speaking. It's not God speaking. If you read what it says, it's talking about our God. It's talking about our brethren. These are the voice of the saints. And then they turn their attention to those who've been martyred in verse number 11. He's not only defeated by this warrior, this, this heavenly warrior named Michael. He's defeated by holy witnesses. And when that happens, when he's cast out, heaven erupts in praise. That's an amazing thing. They start praising God here. Why are they, why are they praising God? Well, first, they're praising God because the Father and the Son, the power and the glory of the Father and the Son has overcome the devil. Second, they're praising God for, uh, they're praising God because on, they're doing so on behalf of the tribulation saints who were martyred. It says in verse number 11, they overcame him. Who are we talking about? The they is described in the last phrase of verse number 11. Those that did not even love their life enough unto death, they, they died the death. Does your Bible have that article in there? I hope it does. I hope at the end of verse number 11, it says, they love not their lives unto the death. That is a specific death. That's just not me dying of old age or cancer. That's the death. What is the death they're talking about? The death of a martyr. He's pointing to those who have given their, their life for Christ. A Michael was able to expel them from heaven, and these Christian martyrs overcame him as well. How did they do that? They had three weapons working for them. The weapons, first of all, the first one is described, they used the blood of the lamb, it says. Second, that verse says they used the word of their testimony. And third, it says, or, or there's just those two things. The, they, have the, they have the blood of the lamb. They have the word of their testimony. And because of those two things, their, their commitment to Christ is demonstrated in the fact 
that they don't fear death. They don't fear it. They had the blood of the lamb. They were fighting an enemy who might kill their body, but he couldn't kill their soul. Remember what Jesus said? Fear, those, fear the, not them that can kill the body. Fear them that can kill the body and the soul, and Satan can't do that. They overcame him because they were washed in the blood of the lamb. I hope you have been. I hope you have been washed in the blood of the lamb. I hope, I hope you know Christ as your savior. And then they, they used the word of their testimony. That word testimony means report. And they so clung to their testimony that when they had to, they died for it. They did not recant. Threatened with death, they refused to renounce Jesus Christ. They loved their Redeemer more than they loved the life that he gave them. So they died for him. They overcame him with the blood of the Lamb and the power of the word of their testimony. Man, if we're ever faced with a situation like that, I hope we finish that well. Don't you? I read this morning, did you, did you read this morning about that street preacher? And I don't know his theology or anything else, but did you read about that street preacher up in, in uh, Reading, Pennsylvania? That was on a public sidewalk, preaching against gay pride, and he was arrested. Not Canada. Not Australia, not Great Britain, Reading, Pennsylvania, USA. They examined the video evidence and they released him. They released him. They said he was assaulted. He wasn't assaulted. Uh, he wasn't, he, they said he was assaulting. He wasn't assaulting anyone. All he was doing was speaking out against homosexuality and the mess that we're in this month of June. And they arrested him for it. They arrested him for it in the United States of America. You know what he wasn't charged with, by the way? He wasn't charged with resisting arrest. And if they come after you and they come after me for our Christianity, I think it's unbiblical for you to resist. I do. If they come after you for something else and you're not guilty of it, that's one thing. But if they're going to come after me for my Christianity, if they're coming after me because of my declaration for Christ, if they're coming after you because you have drawn a line and said, this is biblical and I can't cross that line. If they arrest you for that, go with it. You say, well, I don't know about that. I've got rights. Not before God, you don't. A lot of times we as Americans, we confuse the American rights that we have. And I love our rights, don't you? I love the freedom we have in this country. But we confuse those and we place a higher priority on our citizenship on, on earth than we do our citizenship in heaven. And Jesus said, if you are spitefully used for my sake, turn the other cheek. That guy did not resist arrest. We're arresting you for what you're saying. Okay. But I'm speaking the truth. He went to jail. I thank God he was released. But there, I promise you, there's coming a time in our country where he's not going to be released. He's going to be charged with hate speech, and he's going to serve time. He's going to do it. May God help us to stand. These people are dying for the cause of Christ here. May God help us to be that bold. You have the revealing of this dragon, and he, where we learn his names and his nature. Then you have the removal of the dragon, and thank the Lord. He's kicked out of heaven. He's in the process of final defeat. The last thing, or the fourth, the third thing, rather, is you have the rampage of the dragon. He does not take being kicked out very well. He comes, he goes after it here. He turns his wrath to the only place now that he can still operate. And that's on earth. So he is confined to earth, prohibited from coming back to heaven. And verse number 12 tells us about the fury of this dragon's attack. In fact, this is, this is God warning us. Look what he says in verse number 12. Therefore rejoice ye heavens and ye that dwell in them. Those of you living in heaven, he is not coming back. You're not going to have to hear one more thing about him. But what does he say next? Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. 
beware. That word woe, it's, it's impending destruction and doom that's coming. The Bible says that he knows he has but a short time. He's going to be desperate. He is facing certain and eternal inescapable judgment and he knows it. So if he's only got a little bit of time left, what is he going to do? He is going to go off. I don't think Satan has yet, in human history, I don't think Satan has yet gone full bore as evil as he can be. But here he knows he has a short time. And his fury is going to be released on the planet. The focus, that's the next thing. In verses 13 to the end of the chapter, the focus of the dragon's attract. Uh, attack. The primary focus, we talked about it this morning, is going to be the nation of Israel. We saw that in verses 1 through 6. He's going to go after the woman, the woman that represents Israel. He persecuted, the Bible says, he persecuted the woman. He's chasing after her in hostile pursuit. He's got vengeance and violence on his mind. He is going after this woman. And I want you to see again how Israel is going to be divinely protected. We learned about that a little bit this morning in the supply, but now look what it says. It says that he is go that, that the nation, she is going to be given two wings of a great eagle. Two wings of a great eagle. Keep in mind, this is symbolic. We're talking about a, sim a woman who is the symbol of the nation of Israel. But when you're given... The two wings here, it says, of a great eagle, uh, then that's saying, that's, that's implying that she's going to be able to escape. We live over there by Cherokee Lake, and, and every once in a while we see an eagle down there on the bank of the, of the lake, and it's got dead fish or something. And it's always amazing to me, the crows just, they just pester the hound out of those eagles. If I was that eagle, I'd just turn around and bite his neck off. You know, I, those eagles are just so huge. They, they've got those great big talons, and they put up with these little pesky crows all around them. But when that eagle, when, when you see an eagle, and you guys have seen these eagles around here, don't you love that? There is no mistaking what that bird is. When it takes off, it is like a 747 taking off, isn't it? The Bible says that she's given, look, look at verse number 14, to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly she might escape into the wilderness that's consistent with the scripture God says this in Exodus chapter 19 and verse 4 ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians and how speaking to Israel how I bear you on eagle's wings and brought you up myself there's that eagle's wings escaping for the children of Israel again so God brings Israel into this three and a half year refuge and that's what it means at the end of verse number 14. Don't let that confuse you. She's nourished there for a time and times and half a time. One time, one year. Times, two years. Half a time, half a year. So one year plus two years plus a half a year. Three and a half years. The last three and a half years of the tribulation period, God is taking care of them. Now we have a description here in verse number 15. I can't say that it's literal. But the attack is described in verse number 15, and it says that Satan is going to attack the nation with a flood of water that proceeds out of his mouth. A flood that proceeds out of his mouth. Write down, if you would, in your notes, write down Isaiah 59, 19. The end of that verse says, when the enemy shall come in like a flood, the spirit, saith the Spirit of God, the Spirit of God shall lift up a standard against him. The attack of the enemy in Isaiah 59 is described just like the attack of the enemy in Revelation chapter 12. Comes in like a flood and in both places God's going to intervene and protect. And here in verse 16 God somehow gets the earth involved. I don't know how that happens. But it says when this flood comes that the earth helped the woman. And the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth. I don't know what that means. I said to you this morning, does that mean that nations of the earth are involved in helping? I don't know. But if this is a literal flood of water, wherever Israel has fled to, wherever that remnant has fled to, if this is a tidal wave, literal water flood that Satan's trying to drown them out with, then the scripture says that the earth 
opens up and takes care of that flood. Somehow it absorbs the flood. The earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood. Is it a literal flood of water? I don't know. Is it a symbolic flood of just some other type of attack? And some, I don't know. We can't know that. But I do know this, that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And whatever this attack is, the earth, the Bible says, helps this, this people, helps these uh, Israelites. So whatever the images mean, one thing is clear. Satan's still not going to thwart the plan of God concerning the nation of Israel. He's going to step in and he's going, he's going to help. Hold your finger here and turn back, would you, to, to Isaiah chapter 44 and look at verse number 6. Isaiah 44 and verse number 6. God is not going to allow Satan, this defeated angelic being, to thwart his plan for Israel. Verse 6 says, Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first, and I am the last. And beside me, there is no God. And who as I shall call and shall declare it and set it in order for me since I appointed the ancient people and the things that are coming and shall come, let them show, uh, let them show unto them, fear ye not, neither be afraid. Have not I told you from that time and have declared it? Ye are even my witnesses. Is there a God beside me? Yea, there is no God. I know not any. What is he saying there? There is nothing or no one to compete with what I'm planning for Israel. Look around. God is saying, look around. Is there another God? And he, this is what God says. I don't know of any. Well, if God doesn't know of any, I can tell you pretty much there isn't one because he knows all there is to know. He's going to accomplish his plan for Israel. Israel, the, the Jewish Christians who have been converted by the preaching of the 144,000 evangelists and those who have been converted by the preaching of the two witnesses, they are going to be persecuted and many of them are going to be martyred. But there's going to be a remnant, Matthew 24, verses 1 through 22, talk about there will be a Jewish remnant. God has the final say, and when Jesus comes back, there will be a remnant of Jews waiting for him and recognizing him as Messiah. We're making our way through here uh, in this scripture that describes some pretty fantastic events, and some of them are absolutely horrible occurrences on the earth. Every once in a while, God gives us a reason to rejoice in the book of Revelation. There aren't very many places where it talks about rejoicing here. But God gives some uh, occasions for us to rejoice. Here, in these, in these 11 verses, Satan and all those who are following him, they have fought against God, they've rebelled against God, and now they're put down and eternally put down, ultimately defeated. And we're going to discover at, later in Revelation that the end of Satan is the lake of fire. Never forget this, that the lake of fire, hell was never created for people. It wasn't. Hell was created, the, the only thing in the Bible that gives us the purpose of hell's creation is that it was a place created for the devil and his angels. Now people are going to go there. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, they're going to go there, many of them are. Few are going to be saved. Many more people in hell than will be in heaven. That's just the testimony of scripture. But one of the beings in hell is going to be the devil and all of those that follow him. Let, let me just ask you a question. Do you remember when Saddam Hussein was, he was captured, he pulled out of that hole like a rat. Do you remember when he was sentenced to death in the trial? They were televising this around the world. When he was sentenced to death and the decision was handed down that he was going to be executed, they cut over, most of the stations cut over to the streets of Iraq. Do you remember this? When they cut over to Iraq, it was a massive party. There were people hugging each other and dancing and singing and all shooting guns into the air. They were doing that because Saddam Hussein had been sentenced to death. 
Now, I want to I wanna say this, and I wrote this out so I could, I could be clear on it. I find absolutely no joy, nor should you, in the death of another human being. As Christians, our goal is to be like God. And what does God say? I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. So if that's God's heart, then you and I should not rejoice when another human being is killed like that. Now I'll pause here and say this. I am 100% in favor of the death penalty when it is applied biblically. I am for it. You may or may not be. That's fine. I just see in scripture the call for and the execution of the death penalty. And I'm for it. But even when that is carried out, I ought not to rejoice in it. I should find satisfaction. Did, did Saddam Hussein deserve to be hanged? Absolutely. But I don't take pleasure in that. When they busted in that room and those seals found, uh, found the man who masterminded 9-11 and they shot him, I find satisfaction in the justice, but I don't take pleasure in the fact that that man is in hell. As a Christian, how can I rejoice if someone is in hell? It's a human being. It's a soul that could have been saved had someone got to him with the gospel. But I take great pleasure in knowing that the enemy who is after me and seeking to devour me, I take great pleasure in knowing that one day that great dragon, that old serpent, the devil, Satan, I take great pleasure in knowing he's going to the lake of fire. That's why heaven's rejoicing. They're praising God about this. They're thanking him. I praise the Lord for letting us know that we won't always have an enemy that is constantly on the lookout for how he can destroy us and our families and our church. I thank God that God is one day going to eradicate this adversary, this accuser of the brethren. I don't care how wicked a man or a woman is on this planet. I don't want them to go to hell. Not as a Christian. Do I, do I, am I for justice? Absolutely. Do I support the biblical concept of the death penalty? Absolutely. Honestly, I think it ought to be carried out much swifter than it is. The Bible says, because sentence against an evil work is not speedily executed, therefore it is set in the sons of men to do evil continually. And a 30-year wait for a death sentence for someone who is as guilty as sin, that, dis that, that encourages wickedness. The biblical concept of the death penalty, I'm for it. But I will not rejoice. I will not rejoice because a lost person goes to hell. Can't do that. But to know that our enemy is one day going to be ultimately and eternally defeated and we don't have to battle that, I'm for it. And I'll rejoice with those in heaven. I thank God that he gives us this. You might be in the middle of a spiritual battle. You might be fighting it. I mean, there's, there's circumstances you're facing. You may or may not be sharing them with someone else, and you're about to feel overwhelmed. Isaiah 59, 19 is for you. When the enemy shall come in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord shall raise up a standard against him. I want you to know that you're not always going to fight these battles. You're not going to always have these, these wars. There's coming a day, and I'm thankful for it that Satan's going to be defeated. So take your fear and take your frustration to the Lord and say, God, I know he's ultimately going to be defeated, but I need help today. And Hebrews 4 says, if we, if we go to God, if we go to God seeking his help, we go to the throne of grace, he will give us help and mercy in the time of need. Your enemy's defeated. You're fighting, and I know it. You and I, you and I have great battles with this enemy, but he's defeated. And he knows it. And at this time in history or in the future, he's going to know his time is short and it's going to get bad, but he's still defeated. So thank God for that encouragement. A war going on? There sure is, but there's an end in sight. Lord willing, it'll be soon. I appreciate you being here tonight. 
take the last half of Revelation chapter 12 and let it do what I believe God wants it to do. Christian, let it encourage you that the battles you're facing against this enemy, they're not going to go on forever. We know that and we say that until it is, until it is clouded up and pouring down rain on us and we're in the thick of a fight and we're under it and we're feeling like we're about to be overwhelmed. Sometimes we lose, fight, we lose sight of the fact that we are fighting an enemy that's defeated. God's going to win at the end. You're going to win as his child. Jesus said, you're going to reign with me. You're going to reign in victory with me. Let that chapter do its encouraging work in your hearts. Let's stand tonight and be dismissed in prayer. I appreciate you coming tonight. Pray for our teenagers as they head down south tomorrow. And let's, uh, let's trust that God will give them, a, give them all a great week together, all right? Father, we're grateful for your word and its inspiration. We know that your word is profitable. It's profitable for every part of our lives. It's profitable to us in knowing what's coming. So it gives us peace now. It also motivates us to share the gospel. And we pray, Lord, that we would take those, those parts in Revelation where you pull back the curtain a little bit and remind us that although hell is going to be released on this planet, we're not going to be here. And that ultimately our enemy is going to be defeated. So help us to stand and walk and enjoy the victory that you have made available to us. We pray this in your name. Amen. God bless you, church. Have a great week.